Greetings, Minecrafters. Welcome to what I think is episode five. I mean, I may as well like stop numbering those because I'm gonna forget. Uh, anyway, welcome to the episode on just say no to social comparison. And so last week we were uh, having a chat about how happiness is a choice. Listen to those birds. Oh, they're so happy it's spring. Although it actually snowed yesterday in northern Vermont in May, so northern Vermont is not for the week. Uh, anyway, happiness is definitely a choice. And as mentioned last week, just quick recap is that, you know, I often get a little pushback, which is a good thing because we're criti cri critically thinking, oh, well, wait, I'm diagnosed with this or that and this or that. And, and that is hard. That's an extra something to deal with for sure. And still, happiness is a choice. We just have to, may have to work harder, just like lots of people have to work harder for things for various reasons. And that's how it is. So the number one is becoming the boss of our brain, which means to practice thought control. That's the number one. We are also going to get into uh, mindfulness and gratitude in upcoming episodes because they each kind of need their own. And today I thought we would, you know, con sort of continue on. You know, it's talking about, you know, making choices. Happiness is a choice, yes. Practicing thought control is a daily choice, which is absolutely top tier and part of my own lifestyle, has been for years. And also we have to make other choices. And one of the biggies is uh, learning to manage time spent on social media because it's such a big deal because uh, the social comparison thing with social media is really the biggest deal. So often I start this out and I'll have st my students make a list on the board. I usually get a scribe because listen to those birds, huh? Because my handwriting is just, you know, pretty horrific. My third grade teacher would probably be appalled. So a young adult goes up there and they start, so then it starts, they just start firing away. Not, you know, not tall enough, short enough, thin enough, straight enough wealthy enough, smart enough. It goes on and on and on and on. And in for seasoned grown-ups, that isn't different. They're not writing on the board for me, but it isn't different. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, also still not smart enough. I don't make enough. Um, you know, other people are, have retirement funds and I don't, or I do, but it's not gonna work, or um, a lot of body image stuff with seasoned grown-ups. Um, you know, women in midlife after menopause, that can get challenging. Men have, you know, their own different hormonal changes. And um, that's another one, actually, uh, with the sex thing. Not good enough at that anymore. I actually hear quite a bit of that. And there's a lot of ways we cannot feel enough. And social comparison is honestly a large part of that. And we also have, given the Rona, let's say the body image thing, the average weight gain through the pandemic, I'm just gonna say it's over 20 pounds because I've heard a couple of different things. Between 20 and 36, that's a stretch. That's a lot. And, you know, people, we were all doing the best we could, surviving a trauma, which is what it is. And so there's a lot of not feeling enough. And if we add the social media piece in there, when we're kind of looking at, oh, I'm kind of crossing a brook, hold tight. Uh, when we add the social media piece in there, it's really, largely responsible and I'm going to um, fill you in on the work of Leon Festinger in the early 50s and I actually used his his work his theory on social comparison as uh, a part of the foundation for my dissertation years ago and he you know or back in the early 50s think about how incredibly insightful this was because back in the 50s as we know this is early 50s so I think it was 1951 what's to say early 50s Think about it, back then, how did you compare anything to your neighbors or your colleagues or, you know, friends or whatever? You know, the Murphys got a new station wagon and but they parked it in the garage. So the kids might have been, you know, hanging out the window saying, dad, dad, because back then it would have been, dad, dad, the Murphys have a new station wagon. And right away we're thinking, okay, what's the matter with my family that we've gotten this, you know, this beaten up old car and we only have one. In the 50s, many people just had one. And that, then that starts and somebody gets a second car. How come, how come the O'Briens, I'm just going with the heritage here as I'm a Quinn, how come the O'Briens have two cars, blah, 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 blah. But the difference back then, obviously, is there were no cell phones, no computers, um, no, way, no way to really see this. So when the, when the Murphys 
driving home you'd see it, but then it's in the garage and it's like out of sight, out of mind. So it didn't torment us to death, like in the same way. And now it's literally 24 seven. So mostly this is a big deal with uh, the young adults because it's part of their, their culture and, and FOMO and um, fear of missing out and fear of not having. There's not a really good acronym for that. We'll have to come up with one. Um, you know, fear of not having, and it's just sort of, you know, constant, 24-7. It's a bing, ding, buzz, zip, ringtone, pull me, you know, pulling us out of the present moment and into the land of make pretend, falsity. It's just a made-up world. And here we are, you know, seeing these immediate images when we just check. We don't even know what we're checking for. We just get binged or buzzed or zipped. And then all of a sudden we kind of look at this, and there's somebody in a relationship and somebody just got a new house and somebody just sold their house and got a ton more money than they've asked for because of the Rona prices. In young adult world, somebody just got into graduate school, got into the college of their dreams or just got a scholarship or blah, 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 blah. And then we got the body image stuff kind of all the way through, really, right? Whether you're, you know, a, a teenager, a young adult, um, preteen even, all the way, all the way up through. And this constant comparison has really waned on all of us, regardless of, of age, because, and, and we all know too that with social media, people aren't putting up pictures of them usually in their sweatpants with, you know, that, that, that zit they couldn't get rid of, or, you know, a, a situation where somebody snapped a picture and they had three chins for us, you know, midlifers. Um, it's not, that is not typically the case. It's typically people looking their best and they're airbrushed and this and that. And even though we know that, we're not typically thinking that usually. We just go on there and so-so's in a relationship. And that brings me to, why am I not in a relationship? Or, or maybe I'm in a relationship, but they look so happy because of course they do. They're on Facebook or the Gram or Snapchat or whatever. And of course they're looking happy because they posted it to have everybody, you know, think that they're happy. That's just how it goes. And so even though we know this is make pretend world, it's, its effects really aren't, aren't different. And it's, you must know for sure that any type of social comparison, even with the Murphys back in the 50s, or young adults now, teenagers now, preteens now, seasoned adults now, you know, seeing that, you know, their, their, their couple friends are also in their 50s or 60s or whatever. You know, how is it that they're going on yet another vacation? What's wrong with me? Like, we're both working, or if there's one person, you know, I make a decent, like, how come I, you know, how come I can't do all this? And it really does this sort of immediately to us. And we need to really get a grip on that because here is the thing. Perch right by this rock for a second to kind of get out of the wind. Here's the thing. Social comparison is a straight road to sad and maybe even depressed. And here's the thing, there's something called upward social comparison, and that's when we compare to people who we perceive to have it better than we are, which is most of, mostly what we're doing on Facebook or the Gram or uh, Snapchat or the rest of them. Mostly we're comparing to people we perceive to be happier, in a better relationship, a relationship, in a better college, in a better job, with, you know, with better ability to travel and do things, whatever, whatever, whatever. That's upward social comparison. And that is, you know, the high majority of the time is going to land us in a place of sad and depressed. There is, there's a little window of potential positive here when, let's say we, we uh, bought a gym membership or something because we just thought like, if I buy it, if I purchase it, that kind of commits me. And then we show up once and we see, we walk in, it just happens to be the uh, physically fit hour when most people are looking at are really in shape and not breathing heavily on the treadmills or pelotrons or whatever. And that can be motivating, like, oh, look at that, you know, I too can look like that. There's a window of that that's, that can be positive, that it, it's motivating. The majority of the time, it's not that way, though. The majority of the time, we measure ourselves up against that like a, like a yardstick, you know, and, and it has us feeling less than not enough and if we already felt less than and not enough it reinforces our feelings of less less than and not enough and it just isn't a good way to go we really honestly in an ideal well-being scenario we don't compare to anyone it kind of makes me think of that i mean we're huge hp fans in our house harry potter it makes me think of that scene in um i think it's the first one where harry's sitting in front of the mirror Ariset, and and he's you know he's looking at all his 
all the good stuff behind him. His parents are there, and then Ron comes in, and he looks in the mirror, and he sees that he's head boy and Quidditch team captain and all this stuff. And then Dumbledore, the master, comes in and says, you know, the, the, the one who's truly happy, truly happy when he or she or they look in this mirror, they only see themselves. They just see themselves. It's great, and if you're not HP fans, hopefully that was still making sense to you, because when we don't compare to anyone and we bring that, that approval meter in the, onto the inside, that's when we're truly happy with, with who we are and what we have right now in this moment. That really is the best way to go. Okay, so that's upward social comparison. So mostly doesn't work in our favor. Small window for motivating. Then there's downward social comparison. And you would think that if we're walking around and we're seeing people who are in a really bad place, maybe even um, without housing or whatever, it doesn't mean we're not feeling badly and feeling empathy for them. It isn't that it, everybody's, we're all evil demons, no. We can just take a glance and be like, wow, okay, I guess I'm not doing, you know, I, I could be doing worse. Or, you know, we, have, we all have thoughts like that. And that doesn't tend to go well for us either because we end up feeling badly later on. Like, I can't believe, you know, that person is, you know, just lost their job or that person just this or that. And though I'm, I'm so grateful for having mine, it made me think I'm grateful for having mine. If I had a flicker of a moment where I felt like I was, you know, really doing better than someone else, then we often feel guilty. So there really isn't a way to come out on top with social comparison with the exception of that one little sliver of window. It just has us feeling badly in a straight road to sadness and depression. And so much so that um, it can really go far and lead into um, young adults especially taking their lives. And that's no exaggeration because we know where sadness leading to depression can go. And there's a really good documentary. We started out with a book and it's called Run, Maddie, Run. And I, I show it in my uh, in my one of my classes because here she was this gorgeous young lady you know she I believe she had offered two scholarships she was a tremendous athlete one for soccer and one for track and one was to I forget the first college but the second one was UPenn and so she ended up taking that one and and they show her pictures you know her fa Facebook or I forget what I it was Facebook or the gram it doesn't really isn't important and here she just looked like she had it all you know beautiful and an athlete and smart and going to an ivy and all kinds of party pictures with big smiles and you know arms around friends and things like that and you know very uh unexpectedly one day she climbed up nine stories of a building and jumped and took her life and her friends were absolutely shocked because this 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 young lady seemed to have all of it absolutely all of it and obviously it's more complicated than only being social media because depression itself is complicated. However, if you look at the research out there, it, we're, we're, we're very, 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 very sure that social media is largely the reason that this current generation of young adults is the most anxious and depressed that the United States has ever seen. We know that to be true. I will tell you that I also did some of my own research and it's relatively recent because it's 2018. Uh, here in New England with college students. We measure for anxiety, depression, impulsivity, distractibility, because those are hard to separate, and then um, addiction to social media. And I was kind of focusing, well, actually kind of made to focus, honestly, on Facebook, because and it's very, very transferable to other, other social media. And our results were, uh, I guess you want to say bittersweet, because when somebody's researching, so I'll just say, researcher when a researcher is working on a project they obviously want to find what they set out to find right whatever we predict we want you know the hope is to find that well in this situation it was bittersweet because we did find out what we hope what we set out to find we the hypothesis was correct that um, increases in social media use lead to uh, a decline in well-being and so uh, and we didn't just measure with hours. We measure. We did keep track of hours, and they kind of went right along with it. But we also used a very current. It was actually current by a few months, so within a year anyway. Uh, the multi-phasic inventory for Facebook, and it, it was also measured. Um, sort of the it measured questions that uh, that had to do with emotional investment with the social media, and some of the questions that I'm paraphrasing because obviously I'm out in the woods. You know, uh, one of the, they were on a, like a, like a Likert scale, so like, you know, one to whatever, and you, you measured it like that. 
and uh, let's say social media or Facebook or whatever is the first thing I check when I get out of the when I get out of bed in the morning. And I look to social media or Facebook, whatever, when I get when I'm bored. I look to Facebook or whatever when um, I'm trying to avoid personal obligations. So th things like that. Again, very paraphrase, but it was about the emotional investment, not just the not just the hours. And we found that hands down, when there was um, more engagement in social media, Facebook um, was our method. Uh, that the uh, depression scores were, were very, very high. They went up very, they were very, very high. And I even had a, it's obviously all anonymous, and a couple of students even wrote in the margin because uh, part of the survey was strictly, the little segments, part of the survey was, was depression kind of questions or statements. And uh, two students wrote in, in the margin, am, uh, am I the only one with the highest score on depression? And I thought, wow, just wow. And uh, the impulsivity distractibility scores were up, and the Facebook addiction scores were way up. Again, transferred to other social media. And also, probably the, um, the biggest claim to fame, which was awful, for, awful for, for myself and my research assistant to go through, but we did predict it. So we wanted to find it, and at the same time, it was just such terrible news is as social media engagement went up, life satisfaction just plummeted. It tanked, which is saying that these students that were you know, in the traditional college age range, like let's say 18 to 23 or something, roughly, I think the mean average was 20 point something, they tanked on the life satisfaction scale. It means that these students hate their lives, hate their lives, and it was directly related to within our context social media use and so right there is the, the proof in the pudding as they say we're not we typically don't like to say prove in psychology so we'll say demonstrated shown something like that but we know for a fact that that lots of social media usage leads to you know increased levels of, of depression and decreased levels of life satisfaction and well-being and i know from my own students they talk about the anxiety you know, they, we're, they're very open about it. Plus, I teach psychology, so it kind of opens the door for that discussion anyway. And so it's so important. Hear me when I say how important it is to just unplug the drug as much as you can. You know, and if it's not realistic to completely, you know, shut it down totally, there are ways to do that, ironically, on your phones to do, you know, do not disturb. You can limit time on apps and things like that. And in Minecraft, Typically, I'm actually going to find this out um, tomorrow, uh, in our last when we wind up. Typically, when students do their personal health uh, plan, a personal health care plan, at the end, they have often made big changes in that particular area, with um, some of them completely delete so some of it, and some of them have uh, put timers on themselves for for amount of time allowed on social media, and uh, they really sort of get it. That, that is really affecting their well-being. Also, kind of ironically, I guess, as I ask them about their cell phones, and I say, if you choose to have kids eventually, uh, what do you think you'll have, what do you think you'll do about their cell phones? And it's interesting because usually across the boards, if I have one who doesn't say this, like 99% of them will uh, are very clear, very clear that they're going to have pretty huge limitations, I would say, I can't come up with a percentage, but it's most of them. Well, you know, wait. They, they wouldn't give the child a phone, you know, as soon as they got a phone. A lot of them say, like, for high school or after high school. A lot of them talk about getting the kind of phone. Um, I'm thinking of a track phone. I'm not sure if that's what they meant. But they, uh, where you can just call. You can just call if you have to call home for an emergency, something like that. But you can't have all the texting going on and all the, you know, instant computer, like, little computer access. And... Uh, no matter what, the high, high majority of them would not do things the same way as they had it. And in the same breath, they say, and we know we're, we know we're addicted. We know that we, we're on our phones all the time. And they say it's just, it's just, it's very, very, very ironic. And, um, and I've been asking that question now for the last, I don't know how many years, and the answers have been the same. All different crews of students, and they've all been the same because they, they get that they're addicted to their phones 
or let's say high, not that's a kind of a strong word, although it's true for a lot of them, addicted to their phones, or let's say highly, highly, highly dependent on their phones, especially in the Minecraft, the Minecrafters, after all the mindfulness work and the staying in the moment, they get that social media is a thief, a thief of our most valuable, valuable life minutes that we can't put, you know, a, 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 a price on, and they're just stealing our lives. Social media steals life minutes like a thief. And in order to slow that down and, and, and stop it, the only way to do that is to slow that down and stop it and unplug the drug. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful, social media free day.